Welcome everyone. I'm Chandan Gowda. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Manish Sabarwal to give the colloquium talk this afternoon. Uh, Manish is co-founder and director of Teamly Services, a large, very large uh, staffing and human capitalist firm in the country. He's also a columnist with Indian Express. He, he is a member of the National Skills Commission as well. I mean, I forgot to mention that crucial fact. Um, Manish talk today is titled India's 3E Regime, Employment, Employability, Challenges and Opportunities of Employment, Employability and Education. Um, with that, I invite him to say a bit. Thanks, Manish. So I, I work for a people supply chain company. We've, we've hired somebody every five minutes um, for the last five years. But we have only hired 5% <coughs> of the kids who came to us for a job. So if you, if you think of that, we're, we're sort of at the agony and ecstasy of India's labor market. Um, the, the ecstasy is I'm a child of lower hiring standards. So kids getting jobs with me today wouldn't have got a job three years ago or five years ago. Um, I, we had a telecom clown shouting at us, I remember once saying, you know, we have 200 sales positions open, why haven't you filled them? I said, well, we're doing it for all your competitors. Your hiring standards are too high. So that HR head called me in a few hours and said, okay, I need a pair of hands. I don't care if a brain comes attached. If, if all you need is a pulse, we can do that. And, um, but that's the ecstasy, right? I know economists might worry about the productivity impact in the long run of lower hiring standards, but from a public policy perspective, you're pushing kids into the formal sector because of the demand that is, is sort of leading to lower hiring standards. But if you think about the agony, you know, I had, we had a job fair in Jaipur. Um, 35,000 people showed up. I met 800 of them. I can guarantee if they were born in Delhi, Bombay, or Bangalore, they would have had a job. Unfortunately, they were born in Dosa or Barmer or Junjunu, wherever, in rural Rajasthan, right? So the two most important decisions a child in India makes are to choose your parents wisely and to choose your PIN code wisely. Um, all of you are laughing or sitting here because you did that. Um, I didn't realize that I had really chosen my parents wisely. They taught me English, I was in a city. There, there's so many small things which you sort of come with your opening balance, which actually become really, really important in the long run. So the agony is sort of the fact that the ovarian lottery seems to matter much more. But I, I know after we started Team Lease, I would say I started stepping back even further. And I've, and I've thought of it, you know, the most interesting question of all times is why our country is poor. You know, I landed for my MBA in the US in August 94, and by September I was asking myself, you know, these Americans aren't smarter than us, why are they richer than us? I mean, clearly I can kick their butt individually, right? Or, or why does Joe Sixpack in America who drinks beer and watches college football make $50,000 a year, and why does Ram Bharose who works 18 hours a day make 50,000 rupees a year? Now, it's got nothing to do with Ram Bharose or Joe Sixpack. And the, the productivity is embedded in the air, it is embedded in the institutions, it is embedded in the roads, it is embedded in the uninterrupted power, it is in, it, it is in the law and order. I mean, it's, it's really not got anything to do with Ram Bharose. Ram Bharose is more productive um, in Bangalore than he is in, in Dosa or in Patna or in Lucknow. And obviously Ram Bharose is more productive in Singapore than he is in Bangalore. And Ambrose is even more productive in the US than he is in maybe than in Malaysia. So, so my case has been is that the infrastructure of opportunity is really what this is about. What is the infrastructure of opportunity? And how do you create the infrastructure of opportunity? So my argument with the last government, and I was on the Prime Minister's Skill Council even then, was that, you know, are you really going to be able to legislate productivity? So, you know, there was a right to education act, there was a right to food act, there was a right to information act, there were lots of, some interesting rights, and, but, but the world view was that if we legislate rights, somehow people get them. Now, you know, more people in India have cell phones than bathrooms. Does that mean we should have a right to bathroom act? Or shall we figure out how a billion people got cell phones in their hands? It's just, so, so my case is that the three E's of education, employment, and employability are really the infrastructure of opportunity. They are really what create productivity. And I think it's important to recognize that India doesn't have a jobs problem. We have a wages problem. And I want to spend some time on that because I'm so sick and tired of hearing this whole jobless growth crap. 
we don't have jobless growth. We just have very low formal job growth. Our, so you have to take a fundamental view on whether you believe that India's unemployment rate is a fudge. So our official unemployment rate is 4.9%. Now, do you believe that? Or you say, well, that's a bunch of crap. Well, according to the official definition of unemployment, it is not a fudge. But yes, there's a huge amount of working poor. So everybody who wants a job has a job. They just don't have the wages that they want or they need. So it's, you know, most of it may, 40% may, may of the labor force is working poor, which means they make enough money to live, but not enough money to pull out of poverty. But if you think about it, everybody who wants a job has a job. So what we're talking about is good jobs and bad jobs. What we're talking about is productivity and underemployment. What we're talking about is formal jobs and informal jobs. And, and so to keep this sort of productivity thing at the heart of this sort of 3E challenge, um, everybody can get an education. Does that education lead to a wage premium? Everybody can get a job. Do you get enough wages which are sort of above what you need to live. And, and I know there's a complicated debate around minimum wages and living wages. See, living wages is a philosophical concept, it's a spiritual concept, it's different for different people. Minimum wages is an arithmetical concept and at, at, at present let's sort of talk about how many people can get that. So if you think about productivity being much more than just one thing, right? Why is, um, so I, I would ask you to think about what I, what I call the five geographies of work. So the physical geography of work, the sectoral geography of work, the enterprise geography of work, the education geography of work, and finally the legislative geography of work. And let's, let's walk through each one of them. So the physical geography of work is really, a, to my mind, a very interesting political question, a public policy question of do you take jobs to people or people to jobs? See, in political imagination, you are always taking jobs to people. But in reality, that's really hard, you know, job creation tends to cluster. So we don't have a Chinese New Year in India. You know, China, that's a very interesting phenomena. 300 million, now it's 250 million people buy a train ticket on a four-day weekend in February and go home in China. Now, this started in 1978 with 10 million, 20 million, but, you know, peaked about five years ago, where 250 million basically leave their place of work or residence and go and work somewhere else and come home. Now, we don't have a Chinese New, New Year equivalent in India on Chhat, Diwali, Eid, or Christmas, right? It's not like um, you have mass migration of that scale on any festival or on any season or any time of the year. So we haven't taken jobs to people, nor have we taken people to jobs. And, and my submission is this is really the question of two things. One is regional and the other is urbanization. So India only has 45 cities with more than a million people. China now has 375 cities with more than a million. We have six lakh villages. Two lakh of those villages are less than 200 people. So you're not going to be able to create social infrastructure in some place with less than 200 people. But why am I obsessed about this? Because in the last five, 10 years, this lack of urbanization has created a massive divergence between real wages and nominal wages. So in a job fair in Gwalior, I had a kid tell me, give me 4,000 rupees in Gwalior, 6,000 rupees in Gurgaon, 9,000 rupees in Delhi, and 18,000 rupees in Bombay. My bags are packed, now tell me where you want me to go. I said, why do you need four times more money to go to Bombay? He said, jitte bachche das hazar mein gaye the Bombay, sab wapas aa gaye. Khana, rehna, or office jana. Living, eating, and commuting is not possible with 10,000 with 18, with 10, rupees in Bombay anymore. I said, tum to sala third class paas hai, tumko 18,000 rupay koon dega? He said, mein graduate se khana kam thodi khata hoon. <laughs> I mean, obviously a smart guy, he had a purchasing power parity model in his head, and we hired him. But my submission is, this is a very important question of do you take jobs to people or people to jobs? And we are killing migration um, with the massive divergence between real wages and nominal wages in big cities. Um, it's not clear that productivity in Bombay has gone up so much. So I, I hope urbanization in India isn't about shoving more people into Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, but it is about making uh, you know 50 or 200 or whatever uh, the number of new cities. I think it's also important to recognize that only 5% of population growth in the next 20 years will happen in Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Maharashtra, Gujarat, and Tamil Nadu. Um, the, the demographics of Kerala are already close to Italy, so, um, but 50% of population growth, or four out of 10 kids in the next 20 years will be born in UP, Bihar, and Madhya Pradesh. 
So will we have a Chinese New Year anyway? I don't know, but the equivalent of sort of jobs to people, people to job question is slowly going to have to sort of be answered. Let's shift from the physical geography of work to the sectoral geography of work. So 50% of India works in agriculture. They only generate 12% of India's GDP. So India became the largest producer of milk in the world. Last year we produced 100 million ton, um, 120 million tons of milk. Um, but 75 million people were involved in that process in some way or the other. The US produces 60 million tons of milk with 100,000 people. So these, this 50% agricultural employment, they're not really employed, they're hanging out, right? I think that's important to think about. And more importantly, only 11% of India works in manufacturing. Now that is the same as post-industrial United States, which is per capita income of $45,000. It makes no sense. Now I know people obsess about manufacturing, so the peak of the labor force in manufacturing was Britain in World War II. 45% of their labor force was in manufacturing. China peaked at about 33% of their labor force. They're down to about 27%. The US peaked at about 28% of their labor force in manufacturing. They're down to 11 now, Make in India isn't about getting to 45, 33, or 28. Manufacturing has changed forever. But I think 11% is the wrong number. I think one out of 10 in India are working in manufacturing, so make, make, make in India might just be make for India, but I think we have to think about why manufacturing is only one in 10 of the total labor force. Another problem with the sort of, if you think about the um, enterprise geography of work, which is related to everything else, is the level of informalization in India. So we have 6.3 crore enterprises in India. 1.2 crore of them don't have an office. 1.2 crore work from home. Only 85 lakh enterprises have any form of tax registration, TAN number, PAN number, whatever you want. Only 15 lakh enterprises pay provident fund in ESI, which is mandatory. Only 10 lakh enterprises are actually companies incorporated, of which actually 930,000 are private limited companies. But most tragically, only 18,000 companies in India have a paid up capital of more than 10 crores. Now you have to think of that, 6.3 crore enterprises only translates to 18,000 companies with a paid up capital of more than $1.5 million. It makes no sense. And this on formality matters a lot because of productivity. So if you rank manufacturing, we did an, an exercise with the World Bank, if you rank manufacturing companies by size, at the 90th percentile and 10th percentile, there is a 22 times difference in productivity. Now if there's that big a difference in productivity, you don't pay the wage premium, because I care about wages, and if you don't pay the wage premium, you'll never be productive. See, as an entrepreneur, I've learned there are two kinds of companies you can create, a baby and a dwarf. The baby and a dwarf are both small, but the baby's gonna grow, and the dwarf is gonna stay there. Um, India is a nation of, of, of sort of enterprise dwarfs. These are small companies which stay small, which don't pay the wage premium, and therefore I come back to my old problem which we started with is India doesn't have a jobs problem, it sort of has a, has a wages problem. So when you think of enterprises, I mean I know a lot of people obsess about the informality on the supply side, but you also have to think about informality in the demand side of why do we have such a large number of enterprises which uh, are small and stay small. The US's economy is, is, is five times our size, no, it's much larger. It's, it's about seven, eight, nine times our size. They only have 2.2 crore enterprises. An economy of our size does not need 6.3 crore enterprises. Now maybe one crore, two crore will disappear with GST, but even after that, you will have to have the number of enterprises come down substantially. Now let's, let's think about the education geography of work. You know, I'm, you're, I'm at APU, so I don't have to reinforce this, but about 265 lakh kids take the class 10th exam every year, 105 lakh fail. 160 lakh kids take the class 12th exam, about 80 lakh fail. Of the 80 lakh who pass the class 12th exam, about 50 lakh pass and go to college. So we have about 50 lakh kids going to college every, uh, every sort of year. Um, and it's not like they have learning outcomes. We, India has linked the enrollment problem, but we have not linked the learning outcomes problem. We have a Right to Education Act, which sort of confuses school buildings with building schools. So, you know, you have the kids in school, but you don't really have from and me at the exit gate of the school system, actually feel you don't just don't have the reading, writing, and arithmetic, which actually are becoming probably the most important vocational skills we need. I think we've traditionally had a mismatch between the skill system and, and what we want as employers. For example, you still are required to teach an automobile mechanic with a carburetor. 
No Indian car is made with a carburetor. You still have to have a DC fan in an ITI. So whenever an ITI principal goes to buy a DC fan in the market, that guy says, ITI mein kaam karte kya? Because nobody else is buying a DC fan. But today you can't certify an electrician <laughs> in an ITI unless you have certified him on a DC fan. So there has been obviously a, a, a sort of gap developed between what they are teaching and what we want to see. And I think college gross enrollment ratio, and I will we'll come back to this question about gross enrollment ratio, but India's gross enrollment ratio is whatever, 19%, which is kids between 18 and 24. The world is um, at about 28. Um, America's at 50%. But it is a very interesting question for India on how many kids should go to college. The world is not treating college like it used to. The world has produced more graduates in the last 35 years than it produced in the 800 years before that. You have to think about that. In the last 35 years, we've produced more graduates than in the 800 years since Oxford, Cambridge, Bologna, who, whichever you think was the world's first university. It was 800, 900 years ago, we produced more graduates. So why, what does that mean? It means 60% of taxi drivers in Korea now have a college degree. 31% of retail sales clerks in the US now have a college degree. In fact, 15% of high-end security guards in India now have a college degree. So it absolutely makes no sense for us to position college as a solution to everything. But a college degree seems to matter, right? I mean, Michael Spence got his Nobel Prize for his work on the signaling value of higher education, and I can testify. You know, I went to Wharton, my wife went to Harvard. These, good, these places are good places to be at, but they're better places to be from. <laughs> you know, the fundamental value is being from Wharton or from IIT or from IIM. It's not being at IIT and IIM, the further away you get from it. So I think we have to recognize that the social signaling value of a degree seems to matter, and, and you know, there's, they, we have to figure out how the massification of higher education is, 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 is in some ways enables the vocationalization of higher education and separating it from the higher education system, which in traditional people's minds is purely a university like APU, which is research and knowledge focus, which is a very important component of the overall ecosystem, but it's not the only component that should be there in a world um, going forward. The fifth geography of work is the legislative geography of work, and here I just make one point. In 1991, when we began reforms, 90% of India worked informally. 25 later, years later, 90% of India works informally. That means 100% of net job creation in the last 25 years has happened in informal jobs. This doesn't mean that we haven't created jobs. You know, 150 to 200 million people have been added to the labor force in that time period, which means that those 150 to 200 million went net to the informal sector, the 63 million enterprises, that 6.3 crore rather than the 18,000 companies at the bottom when the enterprise stack, when I sort of laid it out for you. So, you know, what is the regulatory cholesterol which sort of we mean when we talk about the legislative context? I know everybody will jump to labor laws and I'm happy to spend as much time as you want on labor laws, but it's not just labor laws. There's a lot of regulatory cholesterol for entrepreneurs. I'm happy to sort of unpack that for you. But labor laws is one of the components. I think there's a lot of direct taxation. There's a lot of indirect taxation. There's a lot of, you know, GST will sort some of it out. But there's, a, there's just a lot of regulatory cholesterol built in in India at the state, local, and central level. But labor laws are an important problem. And I know many people will sort of have an opinion, and I'd be happy to debate that. But my case is, first of all, the most important labor law change is not Chapter 5B of the Industrial Disputes Act. Hire and fire or an employment contract, which is marriage without divorce, needs to change, but it's absolutely not the first thing we need to change. Labor law reform is the political economy is complex globally. By equating labor law with Chapter 5B of the Industrial Disputes Act, we have done a lot of harm to the process of changing labor laws. But are there lots of other labor laws? We have 22 definitions of wages today. You have 17 definitions of workers. I have 27 different numbers issued to me as a company. Why can't we have another number of companies? We estimate 500 crore sheets of paper, or six lakh trees, are used by enterprises every year to comply with labor laws. Why can't we go paperless, presenceless, and cashless? You know, the India stack, which is starting to make a difference in financial services. Imagine if you applied that to labor laws. Imagine if you applied that to the whole of government, you know, paperless, presenceless, cashless. But it's a very sort of non-controversial plumbing kind of intervention, rather than everybody talking about the philosophy kind of hire and fire and contract labor and, and, and stuff like that. 
And I would submit that the labor law regime sort of is built for a very different world, right? I think the employment has shifted from being a lifetime contract to a taxi cab relationship. And I'm not talking about the uberization of the labor force where everybody is self-employed. I'll come back to that later. But I, the defined benefit, index-linked pension, employment for life, loyalty is sort of, it's sort of over. You know, there was a very interesting book in the 1950s by the editor of Fortune 500, a guy called William White, who wrote a book called Organization Man. You know, he said to get ahead, you have to be a man, first of all. <laughs> which was at that point may have been true, but you have to exchange, in exchange for loyalty, you will get job security, you dress like everybody else, you basically fit in and you will spend your life in one company, you will retire and you will get a pension. You know, one of the companies he modeled it on was IBM. IBM just put out some very interesting numbers. 50% of IBM employees had been with them less than two years. 40% of IBM employees do not go to an IBM office every day. And 30% of IBM employees are now women. Now that is completely changed from what organization man was in 1950s. You know, it was just, you went to the office, you were all men and you all stayed for life. So my submission is the world of work has changed so much and it's also a change in the life of institutions. When the first Fortune 500 list came out in 1950, the average life expectancy of a Fortune 500 company was 65 years. The list which came out last month, the life expectancy of Fortune 500 companies are 15 years. These companies don't last forever. So the assumption that an employer is immortal, and, I, and you can think of so many companies in India which are very interesting right now, but will not be around. Was Netscape a company or a project? You know, I mean, there's so many of the companies you can think about right now. So if you think about the physical geography of work, sectoral, enterprise, education, and legislative geography of work, if we want to transform these in India, this is really about transformation of productivity, right? So it's not more cooks in the kitchen, it's a different recipe. So it's really five labor market transitions, farm to non-farm, rural to urban, subsistence self-employment to decent wage employment, informal enterprises to formal enterprises, and school to work. And I, you know, I, I, I wanted to walk you through that, that sort of horizontal of work, and now we'll focus on human capital. You know, I spend most of my time on, on sort of the supply side, right, on skills, on, on, on stuff like that. But I will, I will, you know, it's, I don't think anybody can tell you which comes first. Does demand create its own supply or does supply create its own demand? I mean, they, I know a lot of people say, oh, well, why, why don't you estimate where the jobs will be in the next five years or 10 years? And I think that's a fool's, or in the next 20 years, you know, I think that's a fool's errand. I have studied about 35 different reports by various countries, you know, US in 2020, UK in 2010, you know, Germany in 20, in 1990. All of those predictions of where the job market will be have the efficacy of palm reading or astrology, right? I mean, even in the US, 50% of the jobs created in every decade in 1960, 70, 80, 90, and 2000 were actually not in existence in the decade before that. So it's very hard to predict where jobs are gonna be. So therefore you want to create a system which is self-healing. Now, what do I mean by self-healing? It's a way that you architect the system to be much more responsive to what's happening. You, you, you create connectivity between the supply side and demand side, not as a one-time you know, curriculum senate intervention, but in a way that is sort of continuously um, connected. So if we think about the supply side, my submission to you is there are three problems. There's a matching problem, which is connecting demand to supply. There's a mismatch problem, which is repairing supply for demand. And there's a pipeline problem, which is preparing supply for demand. And I distinguish between repair and prepare based on the opening balance of the child or the duration of the course. But I think repair and prepare are two different thought worlds and we need to think about how, how those will be sort of thought about. Now the matching is, is a very simple one, right? There's a kid in Durgapur, there's a job in Bangalore, there's a kid in Nashik, there's a job in Bombay. And the Nobel Prize in Economics went to Peter Diamond for his work on search costs and labor markets, right? Um, and if you think about the employment exchanges, the government runs about 1,200 employment exchanges, but last year to the four crore people registered, they only gave three lakh jobs. So they are clearly not doing a good job at uh, matching, which is a kid who already has skills. Now, how will you improve matching? I think there will be sort of very interesting short-term solutions of increasing the signaling value of degrees, doing assessments, 
But the most important way to increase matching, obviously, is to raise formal employment. I, I think employment has much higher signaling value. When you have 90% of people working informally, it doesn't create signaling value on the resume. So, you know, whether you want to change, um, uh, modify labor laws, I think the fundamental point of labor law modification is 90% informal employment should no longer be acceptable to us as a country. We have to we sort of, there's nothing cultural about informal employment. I think there are incentives at an individual entrepreneur's level which, which sort of make a difference. The, you know, if you think about the universal enterprise number which I was sort of, which, I'm, which we have been pushing saying that, you know, why do I have 27 different numbers make it one number? Why does India have among the highest payroll confiscation in the world? So if you think about somebody, when we give them a salary I, in a job fair, I, if you give somebody a 15,000 rupee salary, you say haath wali salary or chitti wali salary. Because 45% of salary today has to be taken away in Provident Fund, EPS, ECLI, EDLI. There's an alphabet soup of what really poor value for money programs. You know, ESI is India's worst health insurance program. It ha there's no health insurance program in India which has a claims ratio of less than 90%. ESI has a claims ratio of 45%. So it only pays out 45% of contributions as benefits. If you think of the Provident Fund scheme, it charges 320 basis points for a government securities mutual fund. Now there's no government securities mutual fund, private or public in India, which charges more than 25 basis points. So ESI and APFO are not only expensive, they are poor value for money and they offer very poor service, right? I mean, there are, there are 100 million members of EPFO, but there are only 40 million currently contributing. The other 60 million are people in frustration who are not able to take their money out or transfer it or their life has been made miserable. Now, it doesn't make sense for more than half your beneficiaries to have forgotten their money with you. That's just not true. So, matching is obviously going to happen in the realm of, of just the what most people would define as fixing employment exchanges, we need to convert them to career centers, we need to do stuff, but also labor law reform comes in matching. Now, in the mismatch, which is really employability, we f have to recognize there is a market failure in skill development. So employers are not willing to pay for training or candidates, but they're willing to pay a premium for trained candidates. Candidates are not willing to pay for training, they're willing to pay for a job. Banks of microfinance aren't willing to lend to the candidate unless the job is guaranteed. And training companies aren't able to fill up their classrooms. So the intersection of employment and employability is really where innovation lies because we're not able to figure out who pays. You know, everybody's trying to topi pen out the other person. You know, parents want government to pay, kids want parents to pay, employer want kids want employer to pay, employer want kids to pay. But we have to find a solution to this rather than passing the parcel around, right? It's not, I mean, in fact, the German Minister of Vocational Training has had a bet with me. He's saying, you can't find a private sector solution to skill development because the benefits go to society or go to the kid. So employers sort of can't um, manufacture their own employees. So therefore, a private funding for a skill solution may not be possible. I disagree with him and we're still trying to work it out. But I think if you think about skills, one of the lowest hanging fruits in skills is apprenticeships, right? India only has three lakh apprentices. Germany has three million, Japan has 10 million, China has 50 million. Now the Apprenticeship Act of 1961 essentially did an apprenticeship like a job. Now it was modified um, last year and now the number of apprentices is slowly starting to increase. But if we had the same percentage of our labor force as Germany in apprentices, we would have you know, 15 million apprentices. We only have three lakh apprentices. So clearly apprentices are very important food. I think in skills governance is going to be important. Um, today the center blames states, states blame center. There's no real fear of falling and no hope of rising. There's no accountability for an ITI principle. I work with an ITI in Chandigarh, which has 100% unemployment, and I work with one in Gandhinagar, which has 100% employment, but the budgets, the promotions, the, 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 it just stays exactly the same. I think the pipeline, which is the third one, which is sort of the, the, the preparing supply for demand. I think one of the most important lessons and one of the most painful lessons for me in the fi when I started working on this about 15 years ago on skills, I used to tell everybody, give the kids to me for three months or six months and we will get them a job. You know, I've, I've, the, the hardest lesson for me has been is you can't teach people in six months what they should have learned in 12 years. So the most important vocational skills are reading, writing, arithmetic and um, 
soft skills. And we absolutely can't teach that in, in six months. So, so fixing the school pipeline, the K-12 system has to give the kids the basic foundation that we can build in. I think my case for vocational universities is, is, a, is, a, is a complicated one, but in my mind it's very clear, but in education regulators they sort of say. So when I made an application for the first vocational university in 2007 to UGC, the UGC chairman said, Mr. Sabawal, you're very confused, a university cannot be vocational. And you idiot, that's exactly why I'm applying. Anyway, UGC didn't give us approval, but Gujarat passed a special bill in 2013 which allowed us to set up a skilled university. We now have 25,000 students. Now, what's the difference between a vocational university and a normal university? I think normal universities are very important. What's the difference between us and them? One is we pray to one God, which is employers. Second is only 5% of our kids are on campus. The balance are either doing an apprenticeship or they're in distance education. And only 5% of our kids are doing a degree, but 100% have the ability to take a three month certificate as an opening balance for a one year diploma, as an opening balance for a two year associate degree or a, or a three year degree. So the optionality, so it's, it's sort of one third ITI, one third college and one third employment exchange if you wanna think about what a vocational university really is. I think in pipeline, of course, English is, is, I have become more and more convinced about it. I know English is a complicated sort of political economy question, but you know, English is like Windows, it's an operating system, it's not really a language. An unintended consequence of the Baptists going to the Northeast is that migrants from the Northeast get 18,000 rupees a month with me, and migrants from UP and Bihar get 8,000 rupees a month with me because of soft skills, English, and, and I think the argument in India for English as a vocational skill is one, but the other argument is it'll, it's always about being bilingual, right? I mean, the two most interesting poets of Hindi and Urdu lit, um, were Firag Gorakhpuri and Harivan Rai Bachchan, both were professors of English literature. <laughs> so it's really not about being one or the other, it's really thinking about um, it in different ways. So, you know, if you think about matching, mismatch, and pipeline, I think the impossible trinity for policymakers is cost, quality, and scale. So one of the most interesting experiments or randomized trials which India ran in the last 20 years was engineering education and medical education, right? We have 15 lakh engineers a year and we only have 30,000 doctors a year. Now, in AICT we had a regulator who was bribed to expand capacity, in MCI we had a regulator who was bribed to keep capacity down, right? Yes, sure, many, 30% of engineering seats are empty this year, 30% of engineering colleges will probably shut down in the next few years, but anybody who wants to be an engineer can be an engineer, and I would argue that mo the, the people supply chain for Infosys, Wipro, IBM, would not have been set up, consequently APU would not have been set up if we didn't have 15 lakh engineering college students coming out every year. Now, is the quality suspect? So. Quantity and quality is an interesting argument to have in education that can you create quality from day one and at what cost can you do that? You know, one of my continuous arguments with the vocational training of Singapore, um, they're a partner of ours somewhere and they spend, fi they spend $13,000 $13, a year on a plumber and the government writes a check for 99% of that amount. I mean, we, we spend $13,000 a year on an IIT engineer, right? I mean, probably less than that. I mean, I went to Wharton, I paid 19,000 rupees an hour. ISB is now about 13,000 rupees an hour. IMs are about 8,000 rupees an hour. IITs are about 3,000 rupees an hour. Vocational training in India is 200 rupees an hour. <laughs> I mean, we, it, we're not gonna be able to compete at, unless we figure out how to pay for all this. So there's, a, there's an excellent book by a US education secretary called John Gardner in the 1960s. He wrote a great book called Can We Be Equal and Excellent? You know, if you want to be equal in a democracy, which a democracy will want to be, how are you going to be excellent? Because excellent is only possible in small numbers. And that's really in the dilemma of business models, right? So you can be like IITs and IIMs with tight entry gates and wide open exit gates. Or you can be like the chartered accountant exam with wide open entry gates and tight exit gates. 95% of the people fail the exam. Vocational training in India has had wide open entry gates and wide open exit gates, <laughs> which is why we've had a sort of signaling value problem. But that's a business model issue, you know. From my perspective, I would love to have wide open entry gates and tight exit gates, but that's obviously a challenge to sort of think. So, you know, let me sort of conclude in talking about the political economy of the transformation. I, I can, I'm happy to answer questions and I have other stuff I can cover if you don't have questions, but I'd prefer to sort of 
I think for me the most interesting um, part of my career began about five years ago when I realized that, you know, the, th the only thing that stood between me and a million daily employees, so I have about 1,30,000 employees on any day. We've had 15 lakh people in the last 1.5 million people since we started 12 years ago. But I said, I want to get to a million daily employees. Now, let's sit down and unpack what stops me from doing that. Five years ago, we actually went for an offsite and we said, what's our binding constraint? And it wasn't better IT systems, it wasn't more corporates to replace the entrepreneur, it wasn't better salespeople, it was actually public policy. It was the labor laws, it was the education system, it was the system. And that's when I started spending sort of 30% of my time on public policy. So I'm on the Prime Minister's Key Council now, I chair part of Niti Aayog's sort of entrepreneurship part, I work with three, four chief ministers, we work in Rajasthan where, where they did labor law reform and four, five other places. So I actually have been to Delhi every week for the last sort of five years and I, and I, and I spend about 25, 30% of my time and making the argument, you know, and, I'm, and, and you're generally fighting the battle for ideas. I know a lot of people who are outside the political economy sort of think that everything gets done by paying off the politician. But that actually is not true about how large policy in India gets made. There is a genuine battle for ideas. There is the status quo which defends what's going on. There are obviously a lot of self-interested people who have a dog in the fight who say this is what, I mean, in advocacy, self-interest can be a fatal flaw. So for me, it's been very interesting to start off making the argument from jobs to skills for education reform. And I, and I think the most important realization for me is India's problem isn't what to do, but how and who to do it. You know, if you can change the date on the Kothari Committee report of 1968 and not go very wrong with higher education reform. I talked about Apprenticeship Act reform. You know, I, I chaired a committee for, you know, Apprenticeship Act reform has been on the table for a long time. Apprenticeship Act was the 20th point program, 20th of the 20 points of Indira Gandhi 20 point program in 1975. Uh, it got done in 2015, so I chaired a committee and, I, and I'll go into that story later about the trust deficit, but I think the innovation which we need to think about in changing things in India is not about what needs to be done. I mean, police reforms, you think of Rustamji report, I mean, I, you name me which problem of India and I'll name you a report which is at least 10 or 20 years old, which you may have to modify a little bit, but you don't have to really go. But where those reports often fail is, they don't think about the what and the who. And I will submit that I think one of the biggest ideas of the current government is cooperative federalism. I, I think that 29 chief or competitive federalism or decentralization, whatever you want to call it. I think 29 chief ministers matter much more than one prime minister for job creation, for skill development and for education. There is no such thing as India's land and labor market. There may be some such thing as India's capital market, but economic wastelands like UP have completely different land markets than Maharashtra, and export labor markets like Bihar have completely different land markets, uh, labor markets than Kerala. You know, Kerala is now 9.5% Bihari, right? And they sent 10% to the Middle East, so they brought 9.5% from Bihar. But um, it's the only place in India in Chhat where you sort of see um, the population decline by 10%. But I think land and labor markets are inherently local. I, I, I think you will have to think, and, th and that was China's genius. China's genius wasn't some Ayatollah in Beijing issuing fatwas. It was really mayors competing for investment on a local basis. And I think that notion that India could be run from Delhi, you know, I have 15 of Indira Gandhi's speeches where she said strong states lead to a weak nation. If, in fact, if you step back even further, if you look at the constituent assembly debates, in the time that they sat before partition, there was actually much stronger states. And then after partition happened, they reversed that to say, no, no, we need to keep the country together, so let's have a strong center. And my sense is that was a decision with a very long shadow because you obviously have not given chief ministers the ability to craft their labor market ecosystems, labor law uh, changes. And, and I would submit 254.2 of the constitution, which Rajasthan used to amend labor laws, right? So the primary understanding of most people is 254.1, which says if state laws and central laws conflict, the central law always wins. There was always 254.2, it said that if states, assemblies want to amend the central law, they should pass it in their assembly, they should send it to the home ministry in Delhi. If Delhi agrees, they can just send it to the president for signature without amending, without getting Lok Sabha or Raj Sabha approval. So 254.2 is what Rajasthan used to amend four labor laws. Now Madhya Pradesh has proposed to amend 19. 
um, Maharashtra is amending 17, Punjab is amending one, Odisha is amending half, somebody else, I don't, the, the amounts aren't important. The belief is that a chief minister can amend a central law. So Tamil Nadu passed exactly the same land law that was withdrawn in Delhi. Tamil Nadu used 254.2 and has got approval now for the land acquisition bill. So I think the, the, the notion of India sort of being 29 states, 29 labor markets where you ha will have clustering is, is very sort of important to think about in the political economy. The next one I think is you have to analyze the problem also carefully. Just do we have a problem of sin of omission or sin of commission? When we started in 1991, there were sins of commission, what the government was doing wrong. My submission is after 25 years of reform, the problem is the sins of omission, what the government isn't doing. And I, and I give you, my parents retired to Kanpur. The four fastest growing industries in Kanpur are private bottled water, private security, private generators, and private schools. There is no state in Uttar Pradesh, right? So even poor people have to buy their water, they have to buy their electricity. My submission is what the state doesn't do. Whenever people, you people or many, you kind of people look at us business people and you think what we want is a small state, we don't want a small state. I don't think a vanishing state. We want a more muscular state in some areas. I mean, if, 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 if no state was respond, was the best thing for entrepreneurship, then Waziristan in Afghanistan or Swat Valley in Pakistan would be hotbeds of entrepreneurial activity, right? There is no state there. But I think what we're trying to make the case is that, you know, we can't solve the primary education problem. We can't solve the urbanization problem. We can't solve the health problem. We can't solve the infrastructure problem from the private sector. Anybody in the private sector, and I remember in the early 90s, lots of people said, you know, this grass grows at night while the government sleeps. And we were all delusional in the private sector. I mean, we have hit the limits of the, what Lan Pritchett at the Kennedy School calls the flailing state, right? We're not a failed state, we're a flailing state. But I think private formalization is very important to think about right now. The final one which I'd like to sort of make with, which and on the political economy and thinking about India is, you know, one of the most irritating classifications of the last 20 years was BRICS. <laughs> you know, Brazil, Russia, and Indonesia have so little in common with India because they are commodity economies. I, I, it just makes no sense for me when, when, you know, when they are hurting now, it's good for us. I mean, they, are, they, they married a pregnant bride and took credit for what happened, right? You have to think about that metaphor. But uh, Ricardo Hosman is my favorite professor at the Kennedy School, he says the best predictor of sustained economic success is economic complexity. Please remember, India is very economically complex. We make everything and do everything. We don't always do it well. We don't always do it at scale. So economic, so we're a 10 horsepower engine running on four horsepower, which is very different from the BRICS, which are a four horsepower engine running on four horsepower. It's the economic complexity as an opening balance for labor markets, as an opening balance for domestic consumption, is very important because India doesn't have the same global manufacturing, same global growth, or same global trade opportunity that China had in 1978. That's not good or bad, we just don't have, when Deng Xiaoping started opening up China, the world was entering a super cycle of growth, it was entering a super cycle of manufacturing outsourcing, and it was entering a super cycle of trade openness. Brexit, Trump, et cetera, is, 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 is obviously rolling back sort of trade openness. And China is a different game. You know, and we had our IPO earlier this year, um, and I was on my IPO roadshow, and one of the investors kept beating me up that exactly 10 years ago, the Chinese economy was the same size as the Indian economy, and they were growing at 13%, and you are growing at 7%. What do you have to say for yourself? I said, well, the 6% is the fixed cost of democracy, right, if you think about it. But I think that's where India's brand is now starting to shine. India will never be hot or cold, we'll be consistently warm. I don't think there's anything wrong with that brand in, in sort of today's world. So if you step back where I started about the infrastructure of opportunity. You know, in 1994, when I landed in the US, there was a front page article on the Wall Street Journal which said that India is more interesting than important. I hope that journalist is eating the newspaper on which she wrote that, right? What's happening in India isn't once in a decade or once in a millennium. It's written once in the lifetime of a country. Uh, I, I mean, I couldn't have done what I've done with Team Lee's, hiring 15 lakh people anywhere else in the world at any other point in time. But if you think about our missed sort of twist with destiny, you know, I, I, I memorized Pandit Nehru's twist with destiny speech when I was a child. 
But we may start to sue destiny, right? There are 300 million people in India who will never read the newspaper that they deliver or sit in the car that they clean or send their kids to the school that they help build. And this is not a problem like cancer or climate change. This is a plumbing problem. I think if you think of the five geographies of work and if you think of the framework of matching, mismatch, and pipeline, there are very specific next steps we can take to solve this productivity problem. Why does Ram Barose make 50,000 rupees a year and why does Joe Six Pack in the US make $50,000 a year? I don't think it's got anything to do with Ram Barose, but I think, you know, we've, the, the jobs, skills, and education change lives in ways that no subsidy ever can. I, I think that's, that's really important to sort of remind ourselves because we spent two lakh crores on NREGS. I argued against NREGS for a long time. I'm not, I'm, is NREGS a jobs program? Because if you position, if, if you think India's problem is jobs, your solution will be NREGS or some other make work program. If you think the solution is wages, you're gonna have to go back to the five geographies of work. You're gonna have to go back to productivity. India doesn't have a jobs problem. We have a wages problem. I, I, I want to sort of repeat that because everything that you hear about India's demographic dividend, you know, 10 lakh kids joining the labor force every month for the next 20, 10 years, is not about that they won't have jobs. It is about the fact that they won't make 15,000 rupees a month or the there's not enough 20,000 rupees a month jobs for them. There are enough 3,000 rupee jobs for them. They just don't want them. Or if they take them, they can't live on them. So it's been fun speaking with you today. I'm happy to sort of um, cover lots of other stuff I have, but if you have questions, that's probably more fun. Okay? Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, I have two sides in me. One is an MBA and other is a sociologist. And those two sides conflict very heavily. And I have heard the MBA version of the, uh, the, sp the spiel uh, from you. And let me ask the sociologist questions um, mm -hmm. from in return. Um, you, you, you are going to say that it was the MBA version, is it? Well, I, I personally <laughs> have switched from the business side no, but my presentation side was the MBA version. This, right? And I can see where you're coming from, and okay. I fully appreciate where you're coming from. Okay. And I, I, I have no... Um, yeah, yeah, I, I'm it's, not... It's a very I'm interesting uh, yeah, yeah. way of looking at it. The, the issue that I'm wanting to discuss is, do you think um, we would ever have a 100% employment which is living wage employment given a system which is completely dependent on markets and capitalist profit making mot profit motive situation your your uh, initial ecology of opportunity or uh, question is it a, is it an is it a plumbing problem or is it an inherent design problem is the question mm -hmm. um, do you think uh, we fix the plumbing and suddenly everybody will have um, and you know living wage jobs Sec and the second question is, what is the temporality? You didn't talk of time. Will it take us 10 years? Will it take us 50 years? Will it take us 100 years? And then what happens to the generations in between? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how long it takes us. I just know that if we continue on the current path, uh, I mean, see, I live in a world of second best choices um, as entrepreneurs, as, as, as people who are, we're not interested in getting things right. We're interested in moving things forward. I mean, I don't, I don't know how, what is right. I, I, I have no interest in being right. I have an interest in being successful. <laughs> and for me, success is not defined as getting somewhere. It is defined as moving forward. For me, 90,000 kids come to me every month, and I hire 5,000 of those kids. I, I could possibly raise, I mean, kissing 100 frogs to find five princesses is, 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 is really bad economics, but it's also heartbreaking. These kids went to the college their parents told them to, they did the school that they were told, but I'm not able to hire them because of sort of employability reasons. So I, I don't know about, you know, if you think about the three sort of sectors around the table, the private sector, the government, and the non-for-profit sectors. The private sector has a trust deficit, non-for-profits have a scale deficit, and the government has an execution deficit. I don't think any one alone solves India's problems. 
I think so, uh, sometimes people have an unrealistic expectation of NGOs. I think they have an unrealistic expectation of the private sector to substitute for the state. I, I don't think we should ever substitute or can substitute for the state. And sometimes people have an unrealistic expectation of what government can do. Um, I, 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 I think there is a balance which is negotiated and renegotiated on a dynamic basis in societies. Um, are we seeing a, a, a renegotiation of the balance between the private sector and, and civil society and government in the world uh, now of the status quo in the last 30 years? I think we are. But I still do believe that 90% informal employment is nothing, is, it, it would be at best the soft bigotry of low expectations. <laughs> and at worst racism to call it culturally Indian. I think 90% informal employment can be explained by micro firm level and individual decisions we make in the labor market. I think that there is, you know, if you were at 30, 40, 50% informality, I could still, there, there may be something we can't explain. But 90% informality is absolutely unforgivable for a country like India, right? My enterprise tax, 6.3 crore enterprises, only 18,000 companies. So yes, I do believe that we could get to a median household income of between five and $8,000. And I don't mean GDP, and I don't mean individual. I said median household income of five to $8,000, um, beyond which it's up to individuals. You know, I know a lot of billionaires who are unhappy. <laughs> I know a lot of people who may, first happiness is a personal thing, right? So I think hunger of poverty, hunger, shelter, I, I think, I might, you know, when you talk about the US, in the official definition of poverty in the US, 60% have a car and 40% have air conditioning, right? In the official definition of poverty in the US. now. Now, our definition of poverty is really, we, we've just decided to add education to it, we've just decided to add healthcare to it, and I think we must continuously um, uh, renegotiate the definition of poverty. But I think our definition of poverty is, is, is far away from what I dream and hope it will be. And I do think that yes, the private sector um, um, could play an important part. Does private sector mean unregulated markets? I mean, that's not true at all. I just think the government should do what the government should do, the private sector should do what we do well, and civil society should do what they well. Uh, if India has to, it's, this is a three-legged stool which isn't balanced if, if any one of those legs is imbalanced. But um, can civil society or government take India to, um, to $8,000 household median income um, by markets? I don't, I, without markets, I don't think so. That's my embarrassing thing. How long will it take? I, I absolutely have no idea. It, it could, I think it could do. Um, China has done a 300 or 400 million people transition from farm to non-farm or from, from rural to urban or poverty to, to medium middle class in 30 years. Um, but they, they had wind at their back. Um, but we have different wind at our back, right? You know, democracy, the, the, uh, uh, institutions and stuff like that. So I think it, at outer limit, it would take as long as China did, um, at, at, at a, is my estimate, in a shorter um, time frame. I think we could do it in 10, 15 years. That's my, I, I think it could. I think we are, we are really a 10 horsepower engine running on four horsepower. You don't have to raise India's horsepower, you have to, fix three things, regulatory cholesterol, infrastructure, and human capital. I mean, those are really, to my mind, you fix the infrastructure, the roads, the power, and stuff like that. You get rid of the regulatory cholesterol, and you improve the human capital. Those are, I mean, those are non-negotiable. Without these three, we won't get to higher productivity. Without those three, markets won't function anymore. You seem to be fairly positive about the apprenticeship mechanism, right? Yeah. To, to solve, and why do you say so? Because it's such a low number anyway, right? We only have three lakh apprentices. Um, even if um, the number of companies who posted a job on Nokri and Monster, <laughs> which is sixty thousand companies, were to take three, four, five, ten apprentices, you would change that number. So the apprenticeship act, written in nineteen sixty one, was basically treated an apprenticeship like a job basically required a license for every apprentice you took. 
basically micro specified which area the apprenticeship could be deployed, the apprentice could be deployed, and micro specified what is the stipend you could pay. Had no linkage to higher education, in fact, had no linkage to vocational education, and basically unleashed a, a, an inspector Raj on you where the CEO of the company could be sent to jail unless you had 2% or 1% of your employees as apprentices. Now, that draconian law where the CEO could, either we should have 15,000 CEOs in jail or we should have 15 million apprentices. We've had neither, right? So uh, I chaired a committee for the, for the, for the Prime Minister's Council. The parliament passed the amendments in 2015 where basically we recognize that an apprenticeship is a classroom. We're trying to, we haven't been able to create the higher education connectivity for apprentices, academic credit, which I'm hoping MHRD will now allow. But if employers, the, the, the sort of license raj for, for hiring apprentices has been removed, obviously subject to the fact that you pay them the unskilled minimum wage or some proportion of that in some skills. So you've made the stipend sort of linked to the unskilled or a proportion of that. And I think that employers are starting to recognize that having one or two or half or whatever, I don't think anybody's even at half percent yet, but having half percent of your um, kids or your people supply chain allows you to create a people supply chain pipeline at the bottom of the pyramid, which traditional um, um, are not. So I would say a combination of the Apprenticeship Act, a combination of the coming higher education linkage of apprentices, and a change in the way employers think about their people supply chain. Those are the three reasons why I think we could easily go to five or 10 million um, pretty quickly. Hi, uh, Manish, I'm interested in uh, the argument that, that takes legal reform or substantive regulatory changes as having so social outcomes. And you mentioned a few, the Apprenticeship Act, you mentioned Rajasthan's labor law reform. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, I mean, you, you talked about EPF, which would require regulatory changes in, in any case, maybe not statutory. I'm curious about whether the connection is so direct and if you're seeing any evidence. I, I, I'm tracking other questions. Um, and we could even take the view on the, uh, I've written elsewhere about the Right to Education Act. Mm -hmm. um, the Right to Education Act, as you mentioned, is ostensibly about enrollment, but is enacted when the enrollment game is up. Mm -hmm. So it has no effect on enrollment in that sense. It might have other goals, but its uh, ostensible goal has, has already been met. So I'm curious about the, the, the your, your sort of, uh, I, I heard from you a sort of faith that legislative change and uh, regulatory change will lead uh, these, these other impacts. I, are you, A, is, is, that, is that correct? Am I hearing you right? And mm -hmm. B, are you seeing any evidence uh, in any of these sectors of intervention that these regulatory changes ease up the labor market in the ways that you imagine? I mean, uh, you, have to, you have to come back to why does India have nine? Is it, is it one law which is going to change anything? Of course not. Is the demonetization of the 500,000 rupee not going to make a difference? No. But this is one of 20 things which needs to be done to tackle that problem, right? So, which is why I come at it from the five geographies of work. The physical geography is related to the sectoral geography because manufacturing is related to infrastructure. The enterprise of 6.3 crore enterprises translating only to 18,000 is related to the um, sectoral geography of work, which is related to the education geography of work. So, you know, as practitioners, my submission to you is that if you wait for all the lights to be green, you'll never leave home. Entrepreneurship is hypothesis testing. You can't prove anything right. How do you, you have to prove it wrong. My submission is Rajasthan's Factory Act changes led to a 200% increase in factory registrations in, uh, in, in Alwa, Bivadi, which is just across the border um, from, from Haryana. My submission is that if Provident Fund gave employee choice, then Provident Fund wouldn't be viewed as a tax. If e people could buy health insurance instead of ESN, I don't care whether it's government health insurance. I'm not talking about private sector. I'm just talking about competition versus monopoly. ESI and EPFO don't have clients, they have hostages. I can guarantee you that if you gave EPFO choice or ESI choice, you would see a tangible outcome on the formal employment of India. 
Because today it is not employers who don't want to pay provident fund in ESI. It is employees who fight it. <laughs> you know, they say haath wali salary or chitti wali salary, you know, at the bottom of the pyramid. So my submission it is, it is pretty easy to prove that um, the 27 different numbers which the government issues would reduce the 500 core sheets of paper which we use for compliance. It, to my mind, there's no question that if the government went paperless, presenceless, and cashless with all of its legislation, the government would be able to track enterprises who are paying EPFO and not paying ESI, who are paying Labor Welfare Board and not paying uh, EDLI. So if you, you know, the, the, the thought world of enforcement from feet on street and inspector has to move to the thought world of big data. That's not gonna happen. So there's one labor law plumbing changes and the other is the philosophical changes. I do believe that an employment contract which is so asymmetric, the chapter 5B of the Industrial Disputes Act which says that you know, once you hire somebody you can't get rid of them, even though an employee can leave um, within 30 days or 90 days, um, to me it's, 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 it doesn't really change the employment contract, it just takes it off balance sheet um, as we have seen. Um, the 100% of net employment growth being in the last, so I am very convinced that the plumbing reforms would have some, would have a much larger impact than people sort of push them off, saying why are you talking about plumbing, man? Talk about, you know, hire and fire, talk about this. I think in a poli from political sequencing perspective, see one thing that I have learned in, in, in reform is that there's a huge difference between the list of ingredients and a recipe. <laughs> the list of ingredients, everybody knows. The recipe is the art, right? Sequencing, proportioning. I mean, I don't know how to cook. You could give me the list of ingredients, but you know, I, I couldn't, couldn't cook, right? I mean, um, the recipe is important. And in, a, in the labor law, the, will it lead to more job creation? I'm not, I, I'm, my, my fundamental argument is India doesn't have a problem of job creation. It has a problem of formal job creation. Will changes in legislation tip the relative uh, level of formality? Just these, just provident fund, ESI choice, going paperless, presenceless, reducing the mandatory confiscation from 45%. And by the way, this is madness, right? A, a person who has 50,000 rupee salary, I only have to deduct 9% from him. And a person who has 20,000 salary, I have to deduct 45% from him. This is the law. It makes no sense. I mean, it's, it's because they say, oh, 50,000 rupees, no PF required, no ESI required, no EDLI required, no labor welfare board required. At 25,000 rupees, I'm to do. So the net hath wali salary versus chitti wali salary, who made this logic that lower people, if you take NSS data, low paid employees don't have a 45% savings rate, right? <laughs> so. If he can't have a 45% savings rate, how can you take 45% of his salary up front away from him? So I am very clear that will is labor laws a solution to India's sort of employment problem? No. But does legislation matter at a firm level, at an individual level, and an aggregate level? Absolutely. I, and, I, and we've tried the status quo. No? I mean, we've, we've tried this model for 50 years. Sometimes my submission is let's try something new without, um, without the non-negotiables, don't negotiate minimum wages, don't negotiate a minimum level of benefits, don't negotiate safety, don't negotiate leave. Make four or five things in labor laws non-negotiable. But you know, having 17 definitions of wages does not benefit any employer or any employee. This just makes us an ATM machine for the labor inspector. Having 22 definitions of workers is absolutely not protecting Indian workers. I mean, airline pilots do not deserve to receive the same protection that uh, a BD worker does. Under today's law, that's true. There's no threshold, there's no salary threshold, it's all subject to the same one. So my submission is yes, I, I, am, I am very clear, I have seen it happen in, 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 uh, on ground, and I think the most successful labor reform in the world was Gerard Schroeder's Hearts Committee in 1999. And he lost the election because of that. But you know, Angela Merkel's manufacturing renaissance, Mittelstand of Germany, which you are seeing right now, is a child of the Hearts Committee reforms in part. There were, there were other components of that. But there was a cover of The Economist in 1998 which said that you know, Germany is the sick man of Europe, and it was a sick man of Europe, right? But 
the manufacturing renaissance, you cannot blame it purely on the EU's misplaced exchange rate or global growth. There was a huge element of regulatory cholesterol, whether it was collective bargaining for the industry, whether it was many other things which went away in the Hearts Committee and which really raised productivity, wages, and uh, formalization in Germany. So I, I can give you many other country examples um, also on that. And I think India's in such an early stage and such high level of formality, before we start denting the formality, it'll be some time. But um, one of the reasons India is poor is that we have 6.3 crore enterprises only translating to 30,000 public limited companies, only translating to 18,000 companies with a paid up capital of more than 10 crores. I mean, it's not, it, it, it's, that is an important factor, the informality, and informality is driven by regulations and laws. Yes, sir. Um, question, uh, Ganesh. Um, what I, the China-India comparison made me think this more starkly, as well as the Harivan Shrai Bachchan example that you gave. Uh, you know, the, that you have a bilingual intellectual of that stage, and this is true for a lot of Indian states for his generation. Yeah, Krishnamurti, yeah. yeah. Anandamurti. <laughs> Anandamurti, sorry. Yeah. No, but the hidden mechanism that made that possible is that all of them went to state schools in the local medium language till their 10th. And afterwards, they would went to an English college and they managed to find the two languages. So this is a long-winded way of saying the states retreat from the education, retreat willy-nilly. What does that portend for the analysis you offer about you know, the need for human capital? You know, uh, and, and it's also linked to cost. Private education has become so expensive. Even people at various trade are offering to shift over that mode. And how would we compare? Both no, but you're, uh, you're, you're implying that government schools will always have to be um, delivered in the local medium. No, no, no. I mean, language is part of it. But in, in having the option of affordable education, a good... Yeah, uh, so uh, I don't think India has any choice to fix government schools. I don't think you fix government schools by beating up private ones. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see a connection. I think fixing private schools or regulating them or supervising them, I mean, India is over-regulated and under-supervised. I, I think we need better supervision. Mm -hmm. But I don't think private school performance costs have anything to do with fixing government schools. Fixing government schools is a problem of itself. It's absolutely imperative. I think it's shameful that we should have 45% of our kids in private schools. Mm -hmm. But it is, it, is, it is absolutely important to recognize that kid people are doing this. I asked somebody in Kanpur why he, a poor person was sending their kid to the private school. And you know, he, your rights as a, as a consumer are higher than your rights as a citizen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's really the answer. I can beat up the teacher, <laughs> I can beat up the principal, saying, "My, why didn't you show up? Why didn't you do this? Why I can shout at him? I can uh, hold him accountable. While in a government school, your, your rights as a citizen are unenforceable. So don't blame parents here, you know? Don't blame the victim here. I, I, my submission is that there is no fear of falling or hope of rising in government schools. I think government school teachers are not um, exactly underpaid. I, so I think that we have to fix government schools, um, absolutely. I don't think the private sector is a viable, sustainable alternative to government school uh, education. But, you know, in a world of second best choices, <laughs> parents will make a choice. Uh, that's just the nature of the beast, that they're not going to wait around. But the obsession of the government with private schools, to my mind, is an antibiotic reaction to government school performance? <laughs> I, mean, I, you, I mean, yeah, you can do what you want with private schools, but you have to fix your government schools, and that is a human capital, that's an organizational problem, right? They're not able to hold their own people accountable, right? I mean, I know lots of government school teachers who send substitutes because of their above market wages, right? So, um, the money is, in, in this model that you offered us, with various expected actions of the government. I didn't hear you say the government ought to do more in this sector, either by way of increased budget expenditure or whatever else. So the government has to do more in this world, where uh, yeah, so This is what has to be done in this world. Yeah. Uh, so the government has to do more in this world, where uh, yeah, so Yes, but government schools are not, uh, I mean, every state 
government has to do that, right? This is not Delhi which will do anything with school education. Sure. But if you think of if you think of one state which I'm familiar with, Rajasthan's enrollment in government schools has gone up. Right? It's the only state in, in the country where government school enrollment is up for some uh, reasons, for various reasons, including accountability. So my sense is, again, 29 chief ministers matter more than one prime minister for this. Do chief ministers need to recognize this? Do many of them recognize this as a high priority? Probably not. But it's absolutely not possible for, um, um, my submission is Delhi to do much other than, and, and I think increasingly you will see, like even in the Right to Education Act, the no detention policy modification, it wasn't modified, it was just said states will decide what they want to do. Um, I think, you know, that's going to be the way forward in many things uh, around human capital. States will have to decide, chief ministers will take charge. I mean, so funds, functions, and functionaries the more, in my model at least, the more you shift it away from Delhi to chief ministers, the better it is. Um, people obviously have other views of standardization and this, that, and the other, but my sense is that um, we've tried the standardization model and the transmission losses between how the law is written, interpreted, practiced, and enforced are so high in India that how the law is written is often misleading. So how it is interpreted, practiced, and enforced will only become more, um, relevant in state capitals rather than sitting in, in, in Delhi. Yes, sir. So I was working in the scaling sector for the last three years before coming here. And uh, I'll try to combine three questions into one, which is that uh, which one, like of all the government initiatives so far, which one do you think has been, has the most potential in the vocational training space? Uh, is it the schools or the ITIs or the apprenticeships? Um, Secondly, do you think that there is scope for improvement in the ITIs? And the third is that should the Ministry of Skill Development be removed altogether and be part of MHRD? Mm -hmm. Well, I think MHRD should be part of the Ministry of Skills. <laughs> That's an easy question to answer. Um, I, I think um, ITIs absolutely need a lot of improvement. And if you think of all the initiatives that, that to me have the largest impact, it is apprenticeships. I think a next biggest impact would be the vocationalization of higher education. I actually think it, in, in my defense, I have changed my mind <laughs> on one thing in the last 10 years, which is the vocationalization of school education. I think vocationalization of school education is a bad idea. I think you should teach them reading, writing, arithmetic, and soft skills till 12th. That's a great foundation. The world of work is changing too fast. So please do not vocationalize school education. M fix your schools. <laughs> you know, give them what they should receive in a K to 12 and don't vocationalize. School. But vocationalization of higher education is important and that right now the ayatollahs at MHRD aren't allowing. You know, there's a caste system in their head about degrees and, you know, training and go this and, you know, vocational training is usually for other people's children. It's not for our children, right? So we want to protect our children from the from vocational training. But I have no question in my mind that apprenticeships combined with higher education um, is, is actually the way of the future for scaling. So apprenticeships, so we have two crore kids in physical classrooms in higher education today. We have 50 lakh kids in distance education, but we only have four lakh kids in apprenticeship. Those are three different classrooms. And I think you have to raise the apprenticeship classroom and combine it with distance education and physical classrooms for the education in, uh, to become more relevant. So I think apprenticeships and higher education vocationalization. I think you can't massify higher education unless you vocationalize higher education. Okay. No, no, I, I, I you know, I, I you know, I, I think, you know, reforms are not the solving of a sum. They are the painting of a picture. I would urge all of you who are sort of thinking, it has been such a great experience for me to spend, you know, when I came out of my Wharton MBA and you, you come from the private sector and start working with government, you think everybody in government is an idiot, you think they're all corrupt, you think that. It is, it is actually, reform is, it, you know, the difference between India and Pakistan is that three million people win an election in India. We were both born on the same night. You know, for somebody like me who was born and brought up in Kashmir, 
That's an important difference between India and Pakistan. But I see in reforms that impact of those three million people winning an election. You know, we don't, nobody agrees on the role of the private sector. Nobody agrees on whether legislation matters or what's the relative role. So it's very, technocrats make bad politicians. I think technocrats make bad policy makers because they tend to think in terms of first best choices. They tend to think in terms of policy rather than politics. And I, and I think they tend to think in terms of conflicts rather than trade-offs. You know, everything is a conflict rather than a trade-off. I, I, you know, and, I will, and I'll be frank with you, in the last government, in the Prime Minister's Skill Council, my biggest question was, how do you get something done in government after everybody agrees with you? You've got to think about that a little bit. <laughs> All the things that I proposed, nobody disagreed with me in the last government, yeah, yeah. But it was a very spiritual level of agreement, right? It was, yeah, yeah, apprenticeship act amendment karna chahiye, vocationalizing karna chahiye, but who's going to do it? You know, in this government, nobody agrees with me. But the response is, who is opposing it? Why is he opposing it? <laughs> Why can't you get it from a chief minister? Why can't you split the difference? <laughs> Why can't you defer this? Why can't you take one third? Why can't you do something later? Why can't you start with plumbing? It's a very deal-making sort of pragmatic mentality that, you know, you're never going to get what you want. Let's move forward. You know, why didn't we do labor reform in Delhi and in Rajasthan or Madhya Pradesh? Because you cannot get labor reform in Delhi. This is not going to happen, at least in the near future. But you can get it in states. Uh, RTE amendments are not going to happen in Delhi. Uh, states are going to use 254 to increasingly going forward. Apprenticeship Act. So, so my submission is that if you think about the three E's of education, employment, and employability, I know there's a huge philosophical underpinning of the private sector versus the public sector about regulation versus legislation, about supervision versus regulation, about states versus center, about in skills between 19 other ministries and two human capital ministries. I mean, there, there are many trade-offs and conflicts which have to be resolved, but we are coming off a so, such a low base. You know, stop arguing about the 10th floor of the building when we are in the ground floor. <laughs> I mean, these 90,000, it breaks my heart, these 90,000 kids or the, you know, and you have to make the math. If I've had 15 lakh people, if I have only hired 5% of the kids who came to me a job, think how many people come to me for a job in the last five years. It's 20 times 15 lakhs. And I can guarantee you, if the apprenticeship regime had been changed 10 years ago, or the vocationalization of higher education had happened, or more innovation was allowed, I would be hiring more than five out of 100. This is not, so will we bang against the limits of reform at some point? Absolutely, but the good is not the enemy of the great. You will never solve a problem, you will always get better. <laughs> this notion that you need to tell me how this will get me to the destination, the destination is an ever receding horizon. <laughs> in human capital. We are not trying to be successful as entrepreneurs. We are trying to move things forward. Am I going to solve India's people's supply chain problem? No. Am I going to die trying? Absolutely. Thank you. It's been an honor to speak with you. Look forward to meeting you again.